Hey, y'all. Welcome back to another Free Our Mind Friday episode. Let's get liberated. Lay, it's Julie Lay here, and Lay's about to tell y'all what we're up to today on this lovely November Friday. Yes, first Friday in November. What a lovely sight to see. It is an honor to introduce our guest from Bay Peace, our organizing associate. And you want to say a little something? Hey everybody, good to be here. My name is Sin. I'm the organizing associate here at Big Peace. Um, I'm just excited to talk about the topic today. Yeah, so today our topic is facilitation tips, holding space for collective healing and transformation. Facilitation is one practice that and skill that our entire team utilizes regularly, whether it's in our meetings, in our spaces with each other, or the work that we're doing out in community. We do a lot of workshops for young folks and community members. And as of recent years, we've been also facilitating a lot of healing circles uh, for community because we know that with our mission around addressing violence and transforming trauma it's critical for us to be able to hold space hold healing space um, and hold space not only for personal healing and transformation but also for collective healing and transformation so we thought it would be dope to share our do's and don'ts and best practices as facilitators so before we dive in into our do's and don'ts, I'm going to kick it off to Sin, and um, we're all going to sh just share a little bit about of our background and journey as facilitators. Yeah, so I guess a little bit about like my background being a facilitator kind of really stemmed from my like creativity, um, because I am like a artists outside of my like day to day with Big Peace. So I make music, but as well, I was um, doing more like spoken word and poetry competitions throughout like the Bay Area for a minute. Um, and then I ended up getting into doing like after school poetry programs um, with a different um, nonprofit based in Oakland. And um, that kind of kick started for me, like what it meant to put curriculum together and what facilitation could really look like outside of like my very little experience with that. Um, and then I came into Bay Peace through my school, Mills College. It was through a sociology of Oakland class that I was taking. And um, it was a requirement to be able to do work on the ground rather than just like saying that you were running with a nonprofit, but not necessarily doing any of the work. Um, so I, reach, I reached out because I was really interested in the ways that we really integrate like arts and healing as a vehicle for change when it comes to social justice issues, as well as like the demographics of youth that we work with. Um, so I ended up just like volunteering, being around and then kind of went into being an intern um, and was just asking more questions around like what is like what is facilitation and also like how do you get into it. So it was a lot of just like seeing how Lay was actually like doing the classes we had um, for different programs that Bay Peace was holding and just kind of me just like observing, asking questions. Um, and I'm a really big like hands on learner. So at some point, just getting thrown into it is kind of the best way for me to learn um, and kind of having lay as a soundboard of like what I was doing well or what I might need work in. Um, yeah. And then ended up just getting into my position and facilitating over and over again until it kind of just becomes like this muscle that you're really working on. Um, and yeah, it's kind of been history ever since. So that's me. Yes, Sin. And let me tell y'all, Sin, I love seeing Sin facilitate our workshops and our healing circles and just like spaces overall. If any of the listeners have been a part of Bay Pieces hours or workshops that we've done, y'all know Sin. So I definitely want to give some praises to you, Sin. Um, yeah, and just like keeping on with the little introductions. Um, I definitely, I feel like 
I never thought I could be a facilitator just because um, growing up with school, I just always felt nervous of going up and just seeing the teacher just do their thing. But thinking about this, like prepping for this episode, I felt like we've become leaders so young and I was just like reminiscing on like my young days of even taking the lead on like doing games or activities like I don't know if y'all ever on like rainy days or something in classrooms um you have to stay in your classroom like you would just like take turns or something leading a game lace and do y'all feel me on this Mm -hmm. yeah sometimes you gotta be like you gotta just be ready to come with it I think somebody (laughs) one of the trainings I attended it was like the soul training school of unity and liberation they were saying like sometimes we gotta be like game ninjas energizer ninjas just ready to kind of facilitate something that works for the space unexpectedly right and even Mm -hmm. like having to do it like I'm talking about like elementary school days, like rainy days, like they would just have, you know, the opportunity of like a kid running the game or something. So I just was reminiscing of like that. I felt like that was my first real like hands-on experience of facilitation and holding space, even as like an eight, uh, I think I was like eight years old or something. Um, but yeah, just thinking about that. And then also I really got into the space with Leilani um, with her other business, um, Wage Art. And um, I said this a few times on our introductions, but uh, Lay brought me on as a youth facilitator. And I definitely hear when you say sin of that you're like a very hands-on person for me, I didn't even know what youth facilitator actually meant. I just really felt aligned with what we were doing in the workshops. And I just really learned from there. And um, it was, I think I was a part, it was three other youth uh, facilitators. And it was really just amazing to hold space for people I also knew, but also new people. And Um, I think one thing I've learned from being a young person into Bay Peace is just really noticing the others around you, like how I noticed Sin and her amazing facilitation skills or Lay's is just like taking that with you because I feel like we're always learning and growing. And I just really think um, that has helped me just kind of get a little more grounded with facilitation. And um, that's when I came into Bay Peace of uh, we do healing circles within classrooms, um, community building games. And even like it could be as sweet as like meetings, like running a whole entire meeting is a huge, a huge process in itself. And like with a lot of practice becomes really well. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. And I'm definitely not the, the facilitator in Bay Peace, but I really do love just to be in those spaces. And when it's my turn, I have a little bit of knowledge, but we're really just still, you know, growing, thriving, learning. Yeah. Leona, you want to tell us you're amazing? backstory of facilitation (laughs) growing thriving learning still always a student Mm -hmm. um yeah but I I just want to give you all your flowers real quick because um you know I always I always just feel so honored to be able to work alongside y'all and I really do believe that you know, our team members and y'all are, are our greatest assets of, of like the organization. And so um, I th- I feel like it's, it's really a privilege for me to be able to kind of like share my skills and my practice with y'all and then see y'all grow into becoming your own amazing, fiery, grounding facilitators. 
for me, I started facilitating in college, probably my first year in college, I joined UC Santa Cruz's Cultural Arts and Diversity Resource Center Board of Directors. And it was my first introduction to student organizing and leadership. And I was the administrative board member, so I was responsible for helping put together the agendas, facilitating the meeting, keeping track of all of our notes and our minutes. Um, so that was really my first entry level into facilitation. And from there, every year, I was leading a different student organization and sometimes it would look like facilitating meetings. A lot of other times it would look like facilitating practices and teaching new skills and new dances or um, like onboarding different students to like projects that our organization was doing. And let's see, my third year in college, I joined this arts bridge program and that's really when I started like teaching in more of an academic setting and teaching specifically for youth and in the arts bridge program I was a teaching assistant for elementary and middle school students and I would teach both music dance and theater classes and um, I started as a teaching assistant. It would usually be me and a group of other interns. And at a certain point, um, our director let me teach my own classes. And so the next year, my fourth year, I was teaching my own theater classes, running my own theater programs for middle school students. Um, and it's crazy because I honestly never expected or thought of or dreamed of doing this type of work. But straight out of college, I joined BACR, Bay Area Community Resources, and also like Sin, started teaching an after school program straight out of college. Um, and my first class that I had to like develop a whole curriculum for my fifth grade students was an art and social justice class. And it was such a steep learning curve for me because you know, I'm fresh out of college. College was really my first, the first space where I was introduced to concepts like social justice and oppression and liberation. And so I didn't do such a great job of like making that language easily accessible for fifth graders. I had to teach the same class to every single grade, every single quarter I would rotate grades. And so that really pushed me to think about, you know, how can we make social justice and concepts like oppression and liberation um, accessible for, you know, little people, <laughs> like small school aged youth. And straight out of B BACR, after I stopped working with them, I joined Bay Peace. And I think a piece is where I've really grown the most and learned the most as a facilitator. Um, not only somebody who facilitates spaces and like, you know, workshops or circles, but also facilitating like change and helping facilitate healing and facilitate transformation, both on a personal level for folks that I work with, youth that I work with, and also on a collective level, like community-based spaces, community-based projects. Um, and so that's kind of what inspired me to, to lean into this topic. And I always tell y'all that like, regardless of what our titles are, facilitation is such a core skill that I want everybody to be able to walk away with um, because it's something, you know, that can be applicable in any, part of our lives that I feel like can, can be really fruitful. So yeah, that's just me. And now here I am. <laughs> now we're facilitating podcast episodes. <laughs> For real. No, I think it's so amazing how even like all of our stories and backgrounds are so different, but 
we're all here, like rocking with each other and creating really amazing spaces with one another and for the community as well. So should we get into the do's and don'ts? <laughs> the do's and don'ts. Let's do it. And y'all already know how we rock. We be dropping gems for y'all. So get out your notebooks, get out your laptops or something just so y'all could write it down and bring in this knowledge into your spaces or your orgs and classrooms as well. Absolutely. And also remember that this will be our second month dropping a Free Our Mind Friday blog post. So on the third Ooh. Friday of November, we'll have a blog article related to this topic so that for folks who aren't able to listen in and might want to read instead, you'll be able to refer to it and have a little recap and something to refer to around the topic of facilitation tips and holding space for collective healing and transformation. Uh, yes. Let's pass it off to our special guest, Sam. Hey, hey. Um, yeah, this is super awesome that we're actually talking about like do's and don'ts of facilitation. Um, because as I mentioned earlier in like the beginning stages for me when I was working here with Bay Peace, it was a lot of like lay coming um to me and just kind of offering that advice of like this is what I saw that you did really well, and this is what I saw that maybe we can tweak. Um, and I think it's really important to say that like with any new thing that you're kind of like venturing into, there's going to be moments where you flop. Like there's definitely been moments within my facilitation where I was like, dang, that was not good. But you can use those like little mishaps as a way to like be better. Um, so yeah, starting with like the do's, the first one I want to mention is community agreements. Um, this is something that we kind of keep as like a general intro always um and i think it's really helped to make like the safe a uh, container of or to make the space like a container of safe space basically um and these community agreements are things like one mic is a good one and that kind of just lets everybody know like when someone's speaking we're respecting them we're like our body language is towards them we're not interrupting anybody um and we usually pair that with saying that like we do a lot of like trauma informed work. Like we're unpacking things constantly, like people's testimonies and experiences that they hold close to their heart. Um, so that's just like a way to kind of create some empathy as well. Um, and these things are not just made by the facilitator or the instructor of the space or classroom, but this is something that you present to your participants or students or whoever you're facilitating space for. Um, of asking them, like, do you agree with these? Are these good for this space right now? Um, or is there anything that we should add or take away from? So I think that's a really big do, at least for me. Um, and then can I go throughout the rest of my list or do we want to pop for these? Oh, yeah, yeah, please do. Okay, for sure, dope. So the next one I put is community building. This is huge for us at Bay Peace, but I think it's great to kind of just keep in whatever spot you're in. Um, yeah, community building can look like icebreakers, which are pretty much just like fun little games. I think it's a really great way to get people out of their comfort zones in like silly ways that you can also connect to like the larger topic you're talking about. So this can look like song association. That's one I really like um, where you get people together and you say a couple like words that have been in songs um, and they have to like sing it. And it's just something like a little bit of competition to kind of get everybody like riled up a little bit and then get into your topic or there's even ones where you're doing like grounding um that's something we also focus on when we're trying to incorporate more wellness um and this can look like deep breaths this can look like talking about what ancestors you want in the space with you that day um and it really like i think of community building as like the glue really <laughs> to kind of bring everybody together mm -hmm. um it's super great and then the third one is to delegate properly. Um, this is something where I definitely had to put a lot of work in. I think for the control freaks out there, if you're going to collaborate within facilitation, <laughs> you need to really learn how to like pass that mic and pass that baton. Because um, you can be so excited and you have like such good intentions, but the impact is like taking up all of that space, right? Um, so delegating properly of like, 
we're all lights and we have so much knowledge um, and people can be adding like really great things. But if you're taking up that space, they don't get the time to like shine in the way that you do as well. Um, and then my last one for a do with facilitation is to bring your own essence and relatability. Like, I don't know about y'all, but we've all been in a classroom where we had a teacher and we knew that they did not want to be there. OK, um, or we've also had a teacher who was like mad corny and try to connect with you, but they did not go about it like the right <laughs> way. You know what I mean? Like we you bring up flashbacks, <laughs> right? You know, and it's embarrassing. and It's also uncomfortable. So something that I found is like just being yourself. So if you're goofy, just be goofy. If you're a little rigid, maybe try to get a little loose with people um, or kind of trying to understand the people you're with, you're not too far from them just because you're the facilitator. Um, so yeah, I think that's like a great way is just to remember to be yourself and like whatever gifts and light you're bringing is going to be felt by those people. Um, so yeah, those are my like little do's with facilitation that I found have really like immensely helped me when it comes to holding down a space properly. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna pass it off to Julie. Yeah, no, thank you so much. You really hit it on the on the nail. I really love I can't even like express this how much of just like those community building games, like how you said it's the glue. It really I just like can't start my day without it. And if like we don't, I'm still gonna kind of like have a little low energy. <laughs> is that is I don't know if that's how y'all feel, but I just love coming into this space and we'll do like some type of games or something and I love when teachers y'all be like in teachers classrooms now and you'll see them too yeah Definitely. and for folks who need some ideas on how to do community building <laughs> don't forget we have yeah. our community building arsenal if you visit our website and tune into the community gift shop we re recently wrote and published our community building arts and all, which is basically like a book of um, a manual of instructions on how to facilitate a bunch of different arts based community building activities because y'all know we love our arts around here yeah we got it in the bag for show for show um but yeah, thanks, Sin. Um, I definitely, I definitely like created my little do's like by just experience, honestly, and like whatever I've noticed that people around me have done because I feel like I'm always going back and forth of like learning from my teachers or learning with somebody who has facilitated spaces, um, and then just bringing them into where babies holds. But um, one of my do's is just plan and prepare to really like we at babies will have multiple meetings of just making sure everything is running smoothly and like going back to sins too of like we don't put everything on one person. Uh, we really like to open up this space as well um, with like your partners just because we we don't believe that you just need to like break your back just to do this one workshop. So like that planning and preparation, even materials of just getting it all together, maybe a day or two before you have to go somewhere or like set it up in your space. It just like really helps y'all. It really absolutely does help me too. Um, and then the next one I also have is listen actively and echo and paraphrase, Lay has been my ultimate teacher on this of when you're listening actively, it's not just nodding your head and moving on from someone's comment or question or whatever it may be, but it's also echoing and paraphrasing what they said and what you possibly agree with or stood out. I just feel that it just makes people like it's a reassuring for someone to kind of get a paraphrase of what they said or echoing from like a teacher or what whichever of just that they actually are listening to me and they're actually noticing what I said instead of just being like oh good job for participating or something um yeah that listen actively is also a huge challenge 
I don't think people or we talk about it enough just because I don't know if y'all could feel this way, but I always feel like if we're like, if we're paying attention to other things too, it's really hard to sometimes listen actively. And I think that's a good muscle to always bring into your spaces. Um, Yeah. And then uh, another thing is using visual aids, sounds, and like hands-on activities. I, for the life of me, cannot just listen to a whole entire lecture and feel like I got everything from them. I don't succeed in it in school and I never have. And I feel like I never will. But just too much words is just crazy. Like I feel so, I feel for the people who just are straight listening to presentations of just talking. Like, I don't know how people do it, but kudos to them because I could never and we could never. So usually visual aids, um, sounds of like kind of, I definitely feel like it kind of relates to what you said, Sin, of like bringing your own essence. I remember I went, I got a new teacher in high school and there was this position of, this position was constantly being changed like every single year. And finally they picked this one teacher and we walked into the classroom and he was playing some like Mac Dre instrumentals. And it was fire, like going into that classroom and mind you, he was like the best teacher. He stayed there for like three years. Um, But even just like playing music while folks are coming in or writing and not, you know, many people are talking or leaving. It's also bringing your own essence. And it's also just not having it just be straight, still silent. It's welcoming when you hear music. Um, And a lot of folks now, like students as well, they like to put in their headphones and read or write. So it's just kind of giving them that like space to do so. And then writing hands-on um, or hands-on work activities. We do a lot of sometimes like work cl- word clouds, answering questions, but switching it up to maybe folks are writing on a sticky note and putting it on the post board. So just not everyone's always talking. And uh, last thing is just participation. Um, not like calling folks like I feel like growing up sometimes teachers like would call on you when you're like I don't know the answer but they felt like I felt like they were trying to embarrass us or something like that I don't know why but bringing in participation to the point of just like you know giving them a little confidence to do so so instead of maybe just calling on like do you know this answer but maybe like, oh, I need a volunteer to write this on the board or like Sin said, like writing community agreements or something, bringing in um, the folks so they could also help you out instead of you just doing it all by yourself. And I think having like group be a part of like the consensus of, oh, which music do you guys want to listen to for this break? Or um, how long do you want this break? Or something like that. I think it just excludes you of just being the dominant person in this space, but more of a community based in this space and having folks help you out as well. And yeah, that's, that's really what, that's really what I got. Hey, okay. Share the game then. Share the game. Um, I just wanted to echo a couple of the things that y'all shared because I feel like some of them are really, really important. Um, like I love what Sin was sharing and, you know, Julie, you echoed a little bit too, just about bringing your essence, you know, for me as a facilitator and a space holder, a big part of what I do and a big part of my focus is that leadership development and youth development. So I'm always kind of coming in from that angle And I think that when we as facilitators and educators are, you know, not shy and really forthcoming about who we are and how we are and bringing our essence to this space, I think it encourages young people to really do the same and to break out of their shells as well. So I love how you brought that in. And, 
Julie, with what you were sharing around the challenge for, you know, active listening, it, it's not only a struggle that we have as facilitators, but it's also a struggle that a lot of folks might have in this space as well. Um, and so I think that learning to practice echoing and paraphrasing what folks share, not only does it help them feel seen and affirmed in their voice, but it also helps other participants be able to recollect what it is that was shared that maybe they may have missed. Um, and so, you know, it's a practice that might help us as facilitators, but also other folks that we're holding space for. Um, and I think with the piece around like participation and and getting participants to support in ways, whether it's scribing or helping take minutes or, you know, taking ownership with decision making. I think what I've seen in holding space is that the more agency that you give participants within a workshop or, you know, within change making spaces, the more engagement and the more like ownership folks will take in this space. Um, and so I definitely think that, you know, pieces like that are really important, especially when it comes to thinking about like engaging young people in movement work and building up um, leadership capacity for folks who are growing within the movement. Um, so yeah, thank you all for sharing those really important pieces and do's. A uh, couple of things that I wanted to share. Number one is to create room for spaciousness. Um, Y'all know I've been on this super less is more tip. Um, and I think the more we pack into our agenda within the small bit of time, the, the harder it gets for us to really facilitate and kind of get through all of our goals. So, you know, in a space that that may that may only allow for like one hour of facilitation, I really only recommend like one key goal. You know, if there's more time than an hour, say there's it's closer to two hours and you know, maybe you have two primary objectives that you think about what you want to accomplish. Um, but spaciousness is also really important because it leaves room for people to ask questions. It leaves room for people to dream and to reflect and to think. Um, and the more we kind of like load on to our agenda, um, the more stressful it is for us too. So um, I definitely encourage folks to create room for spaciousness in your agendas and your planning. Uh, the second thing that I wanted to share as a do um, for us, we do a lot of work around violence prevention, you know, transforming trauma, um, and even educating people on different forms of oppression and, and different political struggles that we as a people might face or, you know, certain communities face. And so I think when we touch on those sorts of topics, it's really important to always end on a positive and uplifting note. So, you know, allowing time in the agenda for um, like dreaming about transformation or talking about solutions or um, even if it's something as simple as like, you know, at the end of the agenda, we're going to do Isang Bagsak, right, where we're going to kind of end in celebration and applause. Um, or even if it's inviting folks to pick out, you know, what is something you, are, you learn and what's a takeaway for you. Um, I think it's really important to like not open up that can of worms without being able to kind of address those wounds properly, right? And like um, infuse the right bit of medicine to support with the pain that might come up when we talk about violence and trauma and oppression. And then the third thing that I wanted to share um, I guess it's kind of connected to creating room for spaciousness, but it's, I think it's really important to be realistic about our considerations with how much time things take. I think when we do too much and when we're not really realistic about how much time something might take, um, it just gets a little more stressful. 
And so it's really important when we're building out our agendas or we're building out our plan that we be realistic and even, you know, offer ourselves a little bit of wiggle room for how much time things might take. You know, maybe we say, uh, we think our initial thought is, oh, check in, we can do that for five minutes when really, you know, it might be better to consider 10 minutes for the check in, right? Because folks are going to roll in, you know, some people might want to share a little more than others. Um, so yeah, giving yourself a little more wiggle room when it comes to consideration for time. Um, and then the last thing, it connects to what Sin was sharing around like delegation. I think it's really important to have a team. Um, in our workshops, you know, they vary between, sometimes we've had circulos with five people. Sometimes we've had workshops with 30, 45, 60 people. And so I, I always recommend that you have a team of facilitators at the very least two so that folks um, can offer support to each other. And, you know, if one person is kind of offering instructions and trying to guide and facilitate the group through an activity, there's another person who might be able to support with you know, if an issue, an unexpected issue comes up, or maybe they can support with scribing or passing out materials or whatever it is. Um, but I, as somebody who's very driven by collaboration and who has seen so many more fruitful, um, just fruitful emergence <laughs> um, from collaboration, I always, I always advocate for having a really solid team of at least two facilitators. And yes. yeah, those are mine. That was a really good one. I didn't even think about the having a team, but it is hecka important to have a team of doing some things. Like, y'all, you should not be having to do it all by yourself. Yeah, never. Never, ever, ever, ever. Um, okay, well, that was what the do. Should we get into the don'ts? The zones. Yeah, yeah, the zones yeah. Of let's the do it. Take it away, Sin. Take it away. All right. Um, I think this kind of goes into something that Lee said when it comes to like spaciousness and whatnot. Um, uh, mine was like super simple, like going over time. There's been multiple mm. moments in program <laughs> where I'm like, bruh, what's going on with the time <laughs> right now? Like it almost never feels like enough. Um, so yeah, just giving yourself a little bit more wiggle room because for me, what's helped is like taking into account, like if you're doing, like if we're doing a healing circle, this means that we're really opening up the space for people to talk and to bring up their experiences. And you can't really put a time limit on that. You don't really want to. Um, mm -hmm. so for things like that, needing more time, um, that's why we have a timekeeper in the agenda to kind of like signal mm -hmm. to the facilitator, like five more minutes, let's wrap it up. Like maybe even coming up with some hand signals because yeah, that could be real helpful. Um, I think the other one is not to press too hard on people's comfort zones. Um, sometimes kind of like going to what Julie was saying of like, when you want people to participate or people might be a little bit more shy, like really having to gauge, like, is this a moment where if I like prompt this person a little bit more, because maybe you see like, they have a really good idea, but they're too shy. Sometimes there's a moment where pushing them out of their comfort zone works. And then there's other times where you're pushing them, but they kind of go more inside of themselves. So maybe like paying attention to body language or just asking like, do you actually want to talk or should I pass it off to someone else? And kind of just like heeding that and like listening to that person um, is super helpful. And then I think my last one is for any like political education is to stay like, fact-based without too much opinions um with political ed versus popular ed it's like um any political or social justice issue where there's facts that you can pull from research um news articles whatever it may be like you're mostly trying to inform people um so it kind of works to say a little bit more impartial when it comes to your opinions given that everybody is different like not everybody thinks like you um so in these moments really focusing on the information giving that to the people in the space um, and having them do with that what they will, even if it's asking you questions, even if it's wanting more resources, or even if that person does have an opinion and doesn't agree, um, 
I think that's just something to kind of like think about of like not really inserting your personal stuff too much. Um, so yeah, those are all the don'ts that I had. I'm going to pass it off to Julie. Yeah, no, I kind of just wanted to, you know, conversate about that last piece of just like staying fact-based is that when I was reading something about facilitation or even like just teachers, something just kept on coming up of just being like staying neutral. And um, I feel like sometimes I think like we have to remind ourselves of that just because of the, you know, like what we're in and like the world that we are in right now that we have a certain influence of things, but like that staying neutral, especially in certain spaces to just uh, speak a lot like more volumes and just opening up the space for folks. So I really like how um, I like how you put that in there. Sin. Yeah. And also like, I guess something that we don't talk about too is just like even reading up on those facts of just like having those facts in the bag just so you can like use them at any given point or something just to like help support. Yeah, I love going to like a do. That's a good one. Like things really be changing all the time too. Um, but yeah, so yeah, thanks, Sin. And something another don't or a don't for me. Um, I talked about it earlier of when I was talking about bringing in uh participation or like the group on consensus or whatever uh just don't dominate the space all the time of like I'm the teacher I'm the facilitator I'm the presenter you have to listen to me just like it's really neutral in this space you're the you're the teacher as much as you're the student and vice versa um so something about having that that mentality of coming in to just really utilize your people and everybody has something to learn or teach uh another thing I wanted to is that kind of coincides of what Sin was saying um even like just don't rush things like how Sin said what we talk about um is like people's feelings people's personal experiences and sometimes those things can't be rushed and there's been plenty of times of maybe some folks were like okay well we have to move on to this thing it kind of dims down someone's voice a little bit especially if you haven't echoed or paraphrased um there's just been plenty of times and it's like really discouraging if someone like rushes through your your piece or something uh so yeah don't don't rush these people because you're offering a space for them to show up who they are and share having that privilege to share too um and then at the third one I know Leigh you said it in your intro of when you facilitated for like fifth graders Um, One of my don'ts is don't overcomplicate language. Okay, don't overcomplicate language. I've had experiences with this. We've all had experiences. And it kind of coincides of just like knowing your audience. Um, There's different language for every, I guess, generation and just uh, age groups and stuff. So really know your audience and just don't overcomplicate language, especially if it's not folks who've been in constant program or community with uh, whatever you're speaking on. And uh, another thing is just don't neglect body language. Uh, That's what kind of sin and I were saying about noticing this person is maybe a little shy and they have the answer you know, you see them, you notice them, you notice their body language. Maybe you want to call on them. But also if there's another person that's like totally just upset or really closed off, um, even in conversations, you know, some people could physically look like they're uncomfortable, you know, don't push it to the side. Uh, We like to have care bears 
in our events or something that might have a little more emotions coming out. So even prepare through really of like having a care bear of signaling and, you know, talking to that person that's obviously uncomfortable or just showing their body language. Um, yeah, just don't neglect your, the body language. Yeah. Lay, what about your don'ts? Oh, my don'ts. Um, I mean, I love how you, I love how you shared the neglect, not to neglect body language. Cause I think as a space holder, as a facilitator, it's really important to really be super present and mindful of the folks you're holding space for. Like I always go in and also the piece about like dominating the space, I think um, I always go into space when I have the role of a facilitator as like being in service of those who I'm holding space for and like facilitating for. And um, this kind of speaks to one of one of my don'ts, which is um, like not being passive about conflict or tension that might emerge. Um, I think that sometimes we hold space and there are disagreements or things are said that might be hurtful or, you know, people might do things or say things that might offend others. And so especially working with young people and especially in like having a community oriented healing centered mindset and framework and how we operate, like those moments of discomfort, I think it's easy for us to kind of like be passive and, you know, we want to shy away from it because we don't want to open up that can of worms. But what I've learned is that leaning into those uncomfortable spaces of addressing conflict, addressing tension, um, addressing struggles, it makes so much room for like growth to emerge and so much room for deeper connections to be created. And so I think that it's a muscle and a skill that, you know, we have to learn. Um, and I think it requires a lot of like social emotional intelligence to learn how to address those sorts of like um, body language or conflict or tensions that might emerge. Um, but I think it's really important to like not be passive about it and to not ignore those types of things. Um, and it's also another reason why all the more reason for us to have a team of facilitators of at least two people, right? Like a lot of um, spaces that we hold or circulos that we facilitate when we plan to bring up like touchy topics or challenging or triggering issues. Um, Sin has really been advocating a lot for having care bears in the space. And, you know, that just allows the space to continue being facilitated by one person and then another person to kind of like offer support and care where folks might need it. So that's one of my don'ts. Another don't is to not be rigid. Um, I think that, you know, even though it's important for us to plan and have an agenda and have a sense of what we plan to do or what we want to accomplish, um, I think that there should always be room for flexibility and there should always be room to address what might come up in spaces. And, um, you know, when we talk about healing, when we talk about transformation, sometimes things don't always go as planned. And, you know, something might come at us out of left field that we might not expect. So I think there's an important balance to have between we have a plan and we know what we came here to do. And we're open to the needs of our people and addressing what emerges for them in real time. So don't be rigid, people. You know, the more rigid you are, the easier you are to break. And the last thing that I'll share as a don't is I think it's really important that we don't address issues, problems, traumas, or struggles without also holding space for the dreaming, for the solutions, for the problem solving. 
it's really connected to what I shared with the do earlier of like trying to end on a positive and more uplifting or transformative note. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's not a good thing when we open up that can of worms and then just kind of send people off, you know, like I've had workshops or classes or spaces where all we do is talk about the issue. And then I just leave feeling so ick. Like I, I leave feeling angry, heavy, like low key irritated and agitated. Um, and I'm also super sensitive to, um, me personally, right? Like I'm super sensitive to certain touchy topics. And so sometimes I leave those spaces feeling really upset. But um, when we make room for folks to process in the dream space, in the, you know, solution based mindset, or kind of like a problem solving mindset, you know, we may not have time to address it and take the action that is needed at that very moment in that very workshop, because you know, this is something that might require time and dedication and like long term commitment, but at least allowing for that space can kind of like shift the energy field of the space that we're holding and really impact the folks so that they can at least walk away feeling inspired and energized as opposed to heavy and burdened and bogged down. So that's my last don't. Um, and it looks like we have a couple announcements. Julie, can I pass it off to you? Yeah, of course. Um, I did just want to just thank you and Lay and Sin of just really spitting this knowledge. Y'all have helped me over the time of working together. And I know a lot of folks are going to be really grateful to hear y'all and us of what our do's and don'ts are so I just wanted to send y'all the flowers um and yeah I just like to wrap it up we're almost at the end of our episode if y'all are still here we thank you we love you and I just wanted to speak on our blog like Lay said earlier if you go onto our website we have some new things to share we have our blog where you can read about our articles relating to our Fear Mind episodes. Um, we also just dropped our fundraising campaign um, to secure sustainers for the amazing work that we do. So go check that out. And we're always posting upcoming events or anywhere that we're going to be at. So you have to come kick it with us. We also have our Instagram at 510, our babies 510. Um, and yeah, I really just wanted to thank our guest, Sin. And I wanted to give the space to you, Sin, just to like share to the folks uh, where we could find you at, your links, your websites, whichever. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This was awesome just to talk about something that yeah, I love to do this and love to have been able to do it with Bay Peace for so long. Um, yeah, you can find me on Instagram um, at Cynthia.Barone. Um, you can find my little bio on the Bay Peace website. Um, I'll be having some performances coming out soon just to be like in Oakland. Um, one this Saturday, 4 p.m., Cafe Lakey on the rooftop. Another one at the Bravo Theater in San Francisco, November 4th. Um, and also hoping to kind of like facilitate more guided meditation and safe spaces around Oakland, um, not only with Bay Peace, but also on my own. So yeah, I guess just stay tuned. And yeah, again, thanks for having me. This was really awesome. Thanks, Sin. Well, yeah, that was it. We hope you guys have a beautiful November. Happy first Friday and stay tuned for the next episode thanks y'all thanks and see y'all next month